Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today in Dave's garage, I'm honored to have Albert Charpentier, designer of the major chips in both the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64, as the first guest in the Dave's Garage interview series. Albert was at MOS in the mid-70s, even before it was acquired by Commodore. Once Commodore had acquired MOS, he went on to design the chips that lent their personality to the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. Now, his success can be measured not only in the tens of millions of units sold, but also in the affinity that many owners still have for the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20 some 40 years later. Albert, thanks so much for joining me today. Why not take us back to the beginning and tell us how you came to be at MOS in the first place? Okay, um, I'm going to give you a little background to sure. me. Point. Um, when I was seven years old, I, I would get up early in the morning sometimes, and you'd see the test pattern on the screen. And as a little kid, I'd go, how did that get there? I mean, here's this box sitting in your room. It had the, we had the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, rabbit ears. Right? right. Back then. And a test pattern there. And I was just fascinated. How did that get there? What, what, what happened? How did that work? So that was my impetus be for becoming an electrical engineer. So now fast forward 20 years, you know, I guess almost 20 years later, and uh, I'm still fascinated by video and video games, and um, I wanted to design a video chip. So I made a presentation to uh, the folks at, at MOS at that time, and um, then um, they said, I said, I can do a video game, and I outlined what I wanted to do. And... Commodore, Commodore MOS was a small company back then, and, and it was very, um, there was a lot of freedom, okay? People, you could make a proposal if it made sense. It was sort of like, I call it pseudo-business plan, but from a technology perspective. Um, but back then in the late 70s, it was everybody was doing all kinds of things in all different kinds of companies. But I had the freedom, there was some freedom there of, of innovation. So they said, sure, go do it. And... Um, but they said, well, before you will let you go do a chip, why don't you do a PC board that will actually prove you know what you're doing? <laughs> so I designed a PCB that literally was about 15 inches on a side, all out of TTL, that mimicked what I wanted to do in a, in a subset <clears throat> of what I wanted to do on a video chip. Right. And so I got that working. And it took me about three months or so, as I recall, and four months. And um, I was able to put a, a picture on the screen and it, uh, to show that I actually knew what I was talking about. Right. <laughs> and um, so once I did that, then I said, okay, go design a chip. And the background for, uh, background for that is there was a, um, uh, a product called the... Uh, a video typewriter, I believe it was called. Um, Don Lancaster's? Yeah, yeah, TV, TV yeah, typewriter. typewriter. Right, exactly. Don Lancaster's book, correct. So I, that was some, one of my uh, references that I used to look at how to do the VIC-1. And if you remember, that the TV typewriter had its character space built into RAW. And it was you couldn't change it, so but it allowed you to put up uh, alphanumeric characters on the screen and, and have essentially uh, a typewriter, TV typewriter, uh, that you could then essentially turn into a, a, a monitor, if you will, okay, for, for typing, whatever. Um, but not particularly useful if you want to do a really cool video game. Right. I had the aha moment at one point to say, well, gee, what if we made the ROM RAM? And what if the processor could change that information in the RAM on the fly so that it would then share the memory with the video so that you could be able to then change the background, whatever, change the, the screen to whatever you wanted. So that was the idea. And then the next piece was to create DMA. Okay. So okay. that video chip and the uh, processor would have equal access to the RAM when they needed it, okay? So, as luck had it, the 6502 microprocessor was a 
essentially uh, would run at one megahertz. I designed the VIC-1 chip to run at approximately one megahertz, and we would share the memory so that on one for, for 500 nanoseconds, the video chip had the, had the RAM, and for the other 500, the microprocessor had the RAM. Okay. So as long as the RAM was able to run at twice the speed of either the video or the, or the CPU, then everything worked well. Okay, and that was that was really the the key moment in that case. And uh, I used static RAM in the in the Vic One uh, that turned into a Vic Twenty eventually um, for that design. So that so was rational there. Nowadays, there is dual ported RAM where two people can read and write from the ROM or from the RAM chip at the same time, effectively, and the chip arbitrates. But with static right. RAM, you can't do that. You have to manually enable who right. has access to it. Is that right? Correct. Well, and that was the idea here is that I simply forced a situation where on phase one, the CPU had its space, okay, and on phase two, the video chip, and then back to phase one, back to phase two. So it was constantly just a 100% a 50-50 interleave, whereas in, in RAMs today and in, in modern architecture, you have weight states and... and be able to arbitrate between who gets the memory more easily and elegantly than we had back then. Right. But concept, no difference in the concept. I actually did have a situation in the VIC-2 where I had to hold off the processor as in normal DMA today in order to get enough access for the video chip, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> so it's good, probably a good time to jump into the 6502 since we're tying yeah. that in. And that really came about from the 6800 chip over at Motorola, and then Chuck Peddle wanted to do a cost-reduced version, and they wouldn't let him, as I understand it. That is correct, yes. Um, the 6800 was, was designed by Chuck Peddle and uh, Will Mathis and, and Bill Mench, and there was, there was about uh, eight guys that were involved in it there, and, and they wanted to go to the next level. And um, Chuck envisioned the CPU has a, I'll call it an industrial controller kind of a product, all right, for doing um, pr controls for printers. And there was, he felt that there were volume opportunities there that really that was the niche that he was aiming at. But in order to hit that, he had to get a lower price point. He wanted to be able to get it out there faster. Motorola really didn't want to look at that. They, 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 they was no, there was no price pressure by anybody to do that. So they said, no, why, why should we do that? So Chuck Peddle approached um, the uh, president of Commodore of MOS Technology at the time in 1975, I believe it was 75, 70, yeah, about 75, and um, the uh, he proposed that they do this new processor and MOS. Uh, they agreed that okay, they they hired on the team to go ahead and do it, okay, and um, it was. It was a great team of guys. I mean, fortunately, MOS Technology had a pretty good process at the time. We were building a lot of calculator chips. We knew how to do that. And we had an N-channel process that was relatively new. But again, the, the fundamentals of the fab were pretty good. So uh, the team put it together, and they called it the 6500. And Chuck Peddle put the um, uh, architecture together. Right? Basically, he was really the guy who uh, he, he formulated the instruction set. Will Mathis did the architecture. Bill Mench did all the uh, uh, the hardware design analysis and design. But MOS had the the, the the infrastructure to allow them to do that. You know, so then the thing came out, and uh, they agreed to shell it for twenty bucks a, a copy, which was you know a re, you know that unheard of, right? Unheard of. It was they were selling for eighty hundred dollars a copy. So going to twenty dollars just created such an environment that everybody started using the thing, you know. And actually, actually the 6502 is what, pa was what is what powered the Atari 2600, obviously the Apple product. Um, it was even in the uh, Nintendo. Right. I mean, it, yeah, I don't know how many millions. It's got to be over 100 million for sure. Well, certainly it was. I mean, the, the Commodore 64 alone sold 30 million units. Right. And Apple and, and so I mean it's it's got to be in the hundreds of millions. I mean it, it's it's still in use today. Yeah, you can buy them at eight megahertz, I believe, and or maybe yeah. sixteen. I'm right. not sure, but yeah, yep, exactly. 
Now, their first rev of it was actually the 6501, and it was a little too compatible because it was pin compatible or instruction compatible yep. with the 6800? It was pin compatible, not instruction set compatible. Okay. Pin. Okay. And uh, Motorola didn't like that. <laughs> I can imagine, especially at 20 bucks. Right, exactly. They were very unhappy. Now, there really wasn't back because processors, even though they were microprocessors and done in semiconductors, CPUs had been around for a while. It wasn't like there was a lot you could patent in a, a, a CPU. So there wasn't a lot of patent protection you could get for a basic CPU at the time. I mean, you, you might you could copyright your instruction set, right? But you know, taking an instruction and doing something with it pretty much been done. <laughs> so there wasn't you really couldn't. But Motorola threatened to sue, so they changed the pin out. And they wouldn't let them call the, the, the 6501, and so that's where the name 6502 came from, to get around and, and pacify Motorola. Right. <laughs> Funny world, right? <laughs> now, the Kim 1 that they put together to sort of as a proof of concept or an engineering sample board for the 6502 was actually not done by Chuck Peddle. It came out of the calculator group, if I'm not Correct. mistaken. Yeah, there was a, a group there that, that I mean, it was clear that to the calculator group that the world was changing. Calculators were not going to be a future oper a career opportunity. <laughs> so um, they saw the opportunity with this. And, and uh, there's a, a couple of guys there, John May in particular, one of the prime movers. He then said, okay, we'll go ahead and we can take this and we can turn this into a, a reference design, if you will, to, to show people how to use 6502 and to give them a, something to play with. And um, it was came from the calculator group, and you'll notice it had a calculator keypad on there. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> One thing I also was wondering about is uh, it's very similar to the architecture of the PET because it's the two two ICIA chips and the CPU and the layout is similar. Memory is even kind of similar. I mean, it was. I mean, uh, yeah, it wasn't just the calculator group. There was a lot of synergy there. Okay, between oh, okay. The communication between the group, and there's no question that Chuck and and Will and so forth interfaced with the calculator guys. The calculator guys knew what they wanted to do. Like I know that the, they designed the um, uh, the, the, the uh, storage, the cassette storage thing that uh, you know the tape recorder storage that was on the Chem One. Uh, I know that uh, I think John May did that. I forget who did that in the group there. I can't remember who did that. But at any rate, um, yeah, there was synergy there uh, and architecturally. But then the 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 calculator guys drove it to a final product, okay, um, and that was right about the time and that the MOS got into financial difficulty because um, uh, there was, uh, you know, they, they, they brought in the guys from Motorola and trying to roll this thing out, so there was quite a bit of cash that was moved out, and, the, and in, in the late, in the mid-70s there, there was a recession, so things got a little tight, and um, that's when uh, the original investors in MOS technology were Alan Bradley, an old, the old resistor company. Okay. And they basically didn't want to put any more money into MOS technology, and um, that's when Commodore came in and, and, and bought them. So they were probably happy to sell almost at that point, it sounds like. Uh, well, it was, it was um, bittersweet, okay? Somebody, you know, it was great that the company was going to survive, but... Um, it was not what most of the folks who were there in that when it started up in '69 had expected as an outcome. Right. And, uh, literally, I would say that almost it was only almost everybody left within a year who was the original part oh, of the really? team. Fabrication guys did not leave, but all the all the calculator engineering guys did. Okay, um, except for one guy, and um, I was sitting there I'm, I'm literally like you know three years out of school now and going gee what does this mean for me <laughs> right should, or should i stay and ultimately i made the decision to stay because of the fact that i said wow you know there's nobody here and and i can help grow this place back up again okay and so that's where you know, i was in the rom designs but and, and literally during that transition is when i uh made that proposal to do the uh, the VIC-1 chip, okay? So it was all during all that chaos, and people were looking for, okay, what do we do next? So there was a, you know, a meeting of all the different things that allowed me that, that opportunity to do that. 
Now, when you're doing chip design in those days, it's pre-CAD, so you're actually laying things out with a template at the level of the flip-flop, basically. That um, is cool. How big is the thing that you're actually building on the table, and how big is the table? And <laughs> it's, it, let me see if I have, I think I may have, I'm going to show you a couple of things that I used here. Yeah, here you go. Do you see that? Yeah. That is, that is the actual logic template that I used to design the, uh, the, the chips that I did. <laughs> okay. And you would, you would literally have a D size, C or D size sheet of vellum paper, it was, you know, the, the plastic uh, graft paper, basically, because it was more durable than regular paper. So it was like a, they called it vellum, but it, right. it was more plastic um, parchment, if you will. Okay, it's very durable. And you would draw that by hand. And you might have 30 or 40 pages of schematics, okay? And then you would take the same thing, and they came in rolls, and you would roll out, a sh and you would do a timing diagram by hand. Okay. And they might go for feet. <laughs> now, ROMs and RAMs are a lot simpler. I mean, there's, there's an address, you access a cell, and you put it out. You, you could do that on a few pages. It wasn't that difficult. But when you started talking about something like a microprocessor or, or a video chip, now there was a whole lot of things to keep track of. And it really came down to um, how you could manage all the different pieces. And you tried to keep the cell structures um, very standardized, okay, like flip-flops. You, you had a flip-flop cell, and you had a... Um, uh, a NAND gate and the NOR gate cells. And so, depending on how fast you needed to move, you'd have a type 1, a type 2, a type 3, and they were just multiples of the standard. So when you looked at something, you wouldn't be taking out a ruler to measure every transistor each time, which, okay. if you weren't careful, you would have to. So once you did the schematic with this, then you'd have a layout designer, well, you'd architect your, your blocks, and then a layout designer would actually turn the 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 schematic into cells and then put the cells together and then this whole thing was done on uh, a big plotter essentially so that you would lay out a piece of paper on a, a giant plotter which was really just a flatbed plotter and then it would just draw them out or draw out all the cells and that were interconnected by it so we did have a little bit of computerization and the fact that you, you were able to digitize a cell, you were able to put cells together, but there was no uh, checking of, did, was the schematic right? There was right. no relations. Um, there was no you know, F, uh, DRCs. You, it was all done by hand. Okay, And that's why the number, number of components, the number of transistors, not only could the process and that handle, I mean, you only had some, your, your geometries were so much bigger then, but physically you couldn't, you, without the computer assist, you couldn't do things much more complicated. It was, it was so hard. Now, when you're doing a RAM or, or a ROM like the Atari ROM, that's 64K, you're not laying out 512,000 flip-flops by hand, so how is that <laughs> so done? Have, you did have the CAD capability of step and repeat. Okay. okay. Lay out the one cell, and you could step it in the X or Y directions. Okay, so it would essentially you you give it a command to do that. So you, there was we had an IBM 360 computer that and and some and some deck stuff that were essentially our our CAD system. It's you know calling it CAD is pretty weak though. I mean it allows you to put some things together on a screen after you drew them, because you draw them up and digitize them, and then that digitized cell you could then step and repeat, and it would have interconnect tabs on it, similar to uh, any, any other, I'll call it uh, chip, if you will, okay, or like a, a TTL pack, so you'd have these connection points that go on a schematic. Do they have spice in those days yet? Yes, we had spice, and that was your only real methodology for doing any simulation with spice. So... Uh, you could do a few hundred transistors, if that, maybe a hundred, not even a few hundred. So about, there was no simulation of the entire chip then, I'm guessing. No, 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 no. Right. You could only halfway, okay? But no, so you had to actually draw off your logic and then go through it and then, okay, this, this signal should go here, and, and you draw that on a, on a big timing diagram. I mean, the one for the VIC-20, honestly, was about 12 feet long. 
<laughs> because you had to get the timing for the vertical sink, the horizontal sink, uh, all of the fetches that had to happen. So that happened over that long video time frame. So you had to make sure you had all that right. So what were your major constraints that you had to face when you did the Vic 1? Obviously, the character resolution is very low on it. What caused that to be so low? Well, a number of things. Speed is the main one. I mean, the fact is, is that back then, I mean, going at, at, at uh, a couple of megahertz was pushing. I mean, just stuff didn't go that fast. That, that Okay. And power. This was done with NMOS. So you're essentially, your, your, your load was a resistor. So... It, 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 every time you had a device that turned off, you were, you were stuck in DC power, okay, for a zero. So you could only fit so much power into that piece of silicon. So you were not only fighting the speed, uh, but power as well. And then the geometries. So there was, those three things were always playing together as to what the, the limits of what you could accomplish would be. Yeah, I guess my graphics card today has a TDP of about 320 watts. That's probably a lot more than you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Could we deal with back then. So we were, we were trying to stay into the you know 120 mil, you know 200 milliwatt. Three, well, maybe a little more than that. Probably 400 milliwatts or something like that. It was pretty low. I mean, you, and so you were bumping up against those those constraints. Yeah, that's an enormous contrast in power consumption. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. The other one that always surprises me is there's a single board reduction of the 6502 down to discrete chips and mm -hmm. LEDs, and it's cool to look at, but it's about a foot square. And apparently, oh. if you scaled the current Mac Ultra's chip out to that scale, it would be two acres in size, or 2.3, which is yeah. another amazing perspective to look at. Oh, it is. It, just think about how computer technology... Essentially, we've. I always, back then, I was always thinking about the fact we're designing computers to help us design computers. Right. Because you needed the assist to be able to get to the next level of complexity that, that would allow us to do the things we wanted to do. Yeah, and it really only feels to me like the last five years we got past the point of making tools to make better tools. Now you can actually use them to be creative. I think you're right. I think that the tool sets are now so good that you can do an awful lot and... Um, it, it, it happened so that the, that the creative part has made the grudge work a little bit less problematic. And so you can't Right. Okay. I agree. Yeah. Now, if I understand correctly, you were big into the notion or into gaming, but you never run up at a game company. Why not go to Bally or Atari or Williams or one of those? Oh, well, um, interesting. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you some of the background when, when, what, why I left Commodore and, and what was going on there at the time. So um, after the, the Commodore 64 was introduced, I actually made a presentation to Jack Tremiel and, and the team there that said I wanted to do a Commodore 80. Now the Commodore 80 was going to be an 80 character version of the Commodore 64. Okay, so you get 80, you know, 80 by 40, a true real uh, right. mod high res, not high res for the time, <laughs> and it would be built in, and you couldn't buy a, a commercially screen like that, so you had to have a built-in monitor, and I wanted to put in a disk drive. What does that sound like? <laughs> Gee, it's a Mac. <laughs> right. So I made that presentation that I wanted to do this and, and do the next generation video chip and, and, and so forth, and um, the Jack Tremiel was... I can still remember the statement he said to me. He said, well, he said, you know, a, co a computer's just a big calculator because he came from the calculator. And <laughs> right. it's spreadsheet, and, and you need a word processor, and um, a couple other things he said in there. He said, and, and once you have that, what more do you need? <laughs> and he said, um, we're going to do the plus four, which eventually became the TED uh, at Commodore, because but once he said that, this was um, May of '82. I I made I was said I'm getting out of here, and it was the first time I'd been told no. Right. <laughs> that I couldn't do what I wanted to do, and um, I just decided it was time to leave. So um, again, what I realized, even though I love video games and I played them a lot and still do, um, the I recognized that that. 
a computer is still the fundamental place you want to be because it gives you productivity and, by the way, it can play good games. So there's an intersection there that makes sense. So when I left uh, Commodore, uh, I started a company called Insonic, which was an audio technology company. And um, But originally, before we did that, I, I wanted to do the Commodore 80. So four of us left from Commodore, and the business plan was to do the Commodore 80, based around the uh, Intel 8088 at the time, because the IBM PC was just coming out in 83. So I left Commodore in September of 81, 82, I mean, and then um, <clears throat> I started working on that. And so we started working on a new video chip and a new audio chip. Because uh, Bob Yannis, who did the audio chip on the Vic, Commodore 64, was one of the people who left with us. Okay. With, okay so he, did, he was working the audio chip. And then we tried to get funding. <clears throat> to launch this Commodore 80, or um, our, our, what we would have called the, the E80. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, we weren't living in, Cal in, in the Silicon Valley. Right. We and uh, we did get some interest from venture capitalists in California. But unfortunately, back then, people tried They said, well, IBM's got the high end. And Compact's got the middle range, and, and Commodore's got the middle and the bottom. And there's no room for anybody else. <laughs> That's what I was told. So here I am. What are we going to do now? So we decided that uh, we, can't, we, we don't have the funding. To, we had some money, okay, but <clears throat> we decided to pivot, finish the audio chip, and become an audio technology company, which ultimately became Sonic. Was it much of a leap to go from video to audio, or is it chips or chips? Or? Uh, chips are, I mean, to me, audio is physics. I mean, it's just like, it's a sensory interface to your, I mean, if I look at any computer system, I always look at it as, it's a way of, of augmenting our senses. Your, your hearing, your, your you know, tactile with a mouse, your, your, um, the video, it's a way of interfacing with the machine through our senses. And so I always look at it as a, as a physics problem that, that how do I make this work, okay? And audio is physics. Now, I'm not a musician. I'm not that kind of a music guy, but Bob Yanis was. Okay. And so we knew that uh, we wanted to do a, uh, an, again, how do you create an opportunity well, there was these company called Fairlight Kurzweil that were selling $10,000 digital sampling uh, audio products, right, keyboards. And from my background at Commodore, she's, let's make it cheap. We'll do it cheap. So that's what we did. We basically took the, um, uh, we did a, 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 I think it was 16 voices at the time. We did a 16-voice digital uh, system, which we called the Mirage. And we put out a keyboard, which was cost which sixteen ninety five. Now I give Fairlight and those guys the credit because they they seeded the market, and there were a lot of musicians who wanted one, and we brought it down to a price that everybody, all the musicians who wanted one and couldn't afford ten thousand dollars, could buy a digital sampling keyboard. Yeah, that's so, what we uh, had in our game studio was a Mirage for exactly that right. purpose. Yeah, that that's uh, that's my baby. Is that another one? <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was a great company. It was a lot of fun to work in there, you know. And we had a good team of people. It was really good. Yeah. Back in the days of the Vic One, it, was it uh, intended that the chip would be for the Vic Twenty, or was it for general gaming? Are we going to sell it to Coleco, or what was the plan with it? Yeah. I mean, it was it was purely for gaming, and that that was what I wanted to do. So we were going to try to sell the chip because MOS was fundamentally a chip company at that time. So we wanted to sell the chips. We were selling chips to Atari in 6502 in the ROMs. So we wanted to sell a next generation video chip to somebody. So um, with the chip came out and it worked and everything was good, but we could never get anybody to bite. And we spent about a year trying to get somebody to say, okay, you know, Coleco and those guys, but nobody nobody wanted to want to try it. So <clears throat> um, I even remember uh, I met uh, the first time I met uh, uh, Wozniak and uh, Steve Jobs. I was at the CES show and we were showing them the the Vic the, the Vic One chip. We were introducing it at CES and 
and uh, Waz and Jobs came by, and uh, it, we I had color, and Apple didn't have color. Right. <laughs> and and they were they were so curious about how I got the color and and the, and the, the RAM background structure that I did, and uh, spent a lot of time querying me. <laughs> I got to know them, you know them a little bit there. Right. We met shows and so forth, and met back and forth quite a few times. <laughs> But that yeah, was a video game. And then in 1977, I guess it was, um, eight, late 77, no, yeah, 77, sometime in that time period, 78, um, I needed, I was interviewing people to join Commodore's engineering team. And I interviewed Bob Yanis, who was at uh, Villanova University in his senior year. And uh, we brought him in for an interview. and taking through a tour, and I showed him the VIC-20 development system, or not the VIC-20, I mean the VIC-1 chip development system. And he went, wow, that's really cool. Can I take one of these and, and, and use it as my senior project at, at Villanova? <laughs> and I went, sure, okay. So he basically took that, and he added a keyboard and a little, little simple OS kind of a thing that he got from somebody, and did a little video screen Commodore, I mean a, a little essentially a very basic little computer system, okay, that could do a few things, write some things to the screen and so forth. So he comes in in September and brings that along. And we see that, and literally like a week later, Jack Tremiel is showing up. And we decided, you know what, let's show Jack this product here. And, and we showed it to him, and he loved it. He went, I want that. <laughs> so he then gets Chuck Petal involved, and there was a lot of strife there because Chuck didn't want to do a low-end computer. He wanted to do a higher-end computer, which was the pet product. Okay? Right. He was one. So Jack really insisted that they work on a this this project with the Vic One chip and turn it into something that is a you know a an everyday consumer computer. Okay, so the project then moved from uh, Valley Forge out to Palo Alto, which we're talking okay. about. And And um, Chuck Petal, Bill Seiler, um, Bob, a bunch of guys worked on putting that VIC-20 together there. Okay. And nobody was assured that it was going to be a success or anything. So actually, they rolled it out in Japan first. Okay, it was called the, instead of calling the VIC-20, it was called the VIC-101 or something like that. I can't remember the exact name. Of it. But there, anyway, there was, it was introduced in Japan first, and it was produced in Japan once they finished the design in California. And then it was then relabeled as a VIC-20 and then introduced uh, to the rest of the world. Okay. In the implementation of a chip like that, as I understand it, literally you've got scan line counters going in both directions, and so you right. know which character block you're in, and you know by simply ending with the last three bits, you know how far down you are in a character definition. Correct. So it's a big but, counter that's figuring out what to display effectively. Is that kind of right? right? Well, you, you can look at, at any video controller. is nothing more than a, an X and Y counter system, okay? Two master counter systems. So you count across in your X, you get to the end, you reset to zero, you bump the vertical counter down one tick. Okay, and you just go through that process, and that's your master clocking system, if you will. Okay, so anywhere along the line, you if you like, for instance, you go, okay, I got to go catch a, I got to go fetch the uh, the pointer that points me to the character that I'm supposed to fetch. Well, you know that I want to put a character at a certain point in the screen, so you're essentially just doing a comparison off of the X counter at that point in time to say, okay, now go do this. All right, and if you think about how a sprite would work, it's nothing more than that. Okay, that was the big thing when I went. I mean, that was the major change from the VIC one to the VIC two. Is I was doubling, doubling the resolution, all essentially, but at the same time adding sprites. So a sprite is nothing more than a, a character. It's it's sixteen by sixteen bits, and um, <clears throat> you have an X and Y pointer. So as the so what you're looking for is the Y pointer gets to the point you say, okay, it's time to display this. So now that kicks in your X comparators. So every time that, so then it's looking for that X. So then it gets, it goes out, says, aha, let me go fetch the two bytes that I'm supposed to display right now. 
and boom, I'll overlay that on top of the background. So then you have another sub counter system that essentially manages all of that, but it's kicked off by the main two counters. So the whole video system is nothing more than an elaborate set of, of, of system of counters and comparators that initiate fetches and, and a serial port. And, I mean, I'm simplifying it, but it's, it's a lot to keep track of, but right. it's a very methodical process uh, that you can architect out, and, and, and because it is uh, regular and, and um, orthogonal. I can't do the math in my head, but I would imagine that you actually get the horizontal and vertical sync just by every 280 ticks we're going to generate right. one, and every 32 we'll yep. generate the yep. other. Up there, it gets to this tick, you, you make vertical sync start, and you, you get to the next one, and, and you make it go away. And, and so, it's, again, it's just lots and lots of comparisons, compares off of this, these two master counters. There's a guy on YouTube called Ben Eater, and I don't know if you've seen him, but he has a great series where he starts with a 6502 and a breadboard, and he builds a computer. And he gets to the video section, and he can only do about 200 by 200 resolution in color, but he does it all with TTL series logic chips, and you get a really good impression of how it actually works. Yeah. Uh, I was just at the, um, the Vintage Computer Forum in, uh, at, at a couple of weeks ago with Bill Hurd, and it was fascinating that while there were certainly a lot of old guys like myself there, there were a lot of younger people there. And what I was fascinated by was, and I started just talking to them, what, what, what do you find interesting? And the reply was, was, I thought was wonderful. It's like, well, the Commodore 64 type product was the false, first really fully capable computer system, but yet simple enough to understand. Right. So if, if you were to study that as, as, okay, how does a computer work? You can get in and understand all the pieces, and they're the same as today's computer. There's not, I mean, there's just a lot more of it. And um, with the exception of, of, of uh, uh, cache systems and memory management, there's not a, a whole lot of difference um, that were added to, you know, everything just went faster, and more of it and faster. Uh, but fundamentally, um, you, if you, you, can, you can study it, uh, something like the Commodore 64 and really get to understand all the pieces of a computer uh, that can fit and it can still fit in your head. <laughs> right. I just had a discussion with Mark Zibikowski from Microsoft who's been there since MS-DOS 1.2. And wow. uh, I asked him, what was the, because he's all the way through NT and all the IO code and everything else, but I asked him, what was the last point that you think you understood the entire system front to back in depth? And for him, it was like MS-DOS 3.3 or something in that era. <laughs> Whereas when yeah. you got to NT, he would understand the I.O. subsystem entirely, but not the entire computer. So. Exactly. It, it's just, there's just too much now, and, and it, no one person can actually absorb it all. Uh, right. Teams of people. Whereas, well, with the Commodore 64, there was like five of us. <laughs> I mean, 6502, where there were eight guys, I mean, you can't do that today. Right. It's, complicated but hey that's why we built computers to help us do these things <laughs> that's right so in terms of process uh, how was it how many mills was your actual oh, size you drew something of what we were for I mean the, the transistor uh, channel okay from, from the drain to the source okay that was our minimum geometry we drew those at four mills okay so four mills is um, I don't know my conversion is anymore. <laughs> Ten thousand one hundred sixty nanometers, I think. Right. Okay, so that was something the, like uh, that, or one thousand and sixteen. Yeah, when yeah, well, I'm off by yeah. a factor of ten, but it's a lot of nanometers. Yeah, it's big. Okay. Now and then we would shrink. They would actually shrink that photographically at the, when they made the mask down to point three five, and in some cases point three. Okay. So whatever as as the photolithographic process improved. That way you could just shrink things photographically and not have to go back and redraw everything. Okay, so generally we, we would draw it at four mils. Uh, not four mils. Uh, it was point four. I'm sorry, I was off by a dec uh, by a decimal. Point. Right, that's point ten thousand one sixty. There right. you go. <laughs> yes, point four mils. So and then they would shrink it to point three five, and eventually they got to point three. So like the the most of my stuff was was point uh, three five mils. And that was your smallest 
reasonable dimension that you could do. There would, you could do a, you could do a contact between layers. I think was point two five mils, um, but that was it. So that was pretty big in comparison to today's technology. Okay. Yeah, ten thousand okay. versus what are we at seven and five now? Right. Yeah, it's crazy. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, one thing I've always wondered is when I worked on MS-DOS, there was no reuse. If you wanted to output a decimal number, you had to write the hex to decimal conversion yourself, other than what was in the system BIOS. But when you guys were designing chips, did you go and grab a section of logic from the VIC-1 to make the VIC-2, or was everything a clean sheet from the beginning? It was, it was clear. It, you had to start over again. Okay. It was double the resolution. Um, we were going to add more features, the sprites. I mean, it was... You know, architecturally, the you know the DMA and those kinds of pieces are needed, but everything was again running running faster now. Um, yeah, so you start, you know that here's how you did it. Again, it's a big counter system, control system, but you started over again. It really wasn't okay. Edit a schematic and and go to the next thing. We started over again. Um, in terms of reuse, again, did you have macros for bigger blocks? Or, or not macros, but if you wanted to do a counter, did you have to lay out all the NOR gates, or did you have a here's a counter block? It was a, a counter was essentially you would lay out one bit of the counter. Okay. Then it, you would have a carry out, which would go to the next bit. Okay, so when that kicked over. So you would essentially just then have one cell that you would lay out, and you would step that for as many bits as you needed in the counter. Okay. So you'd only lay it out once. So again, you wanted to make sure that you did your logic so that you didn't have to lay it out. So you made sure that your, your logic would go, okay, so this output goes to this input, and you'd set it all up so you could just step and repeat. Yeah. Um, before we leave the VIC-20 then, I'm kind of wondering about the system software a little bit, and who wrote that, and when did it go from becoming just a layer for Microsoft's basic versus like a real kernel for other developers to call? Yeah, that was done by uh, Bob Bob Russell, Bill Seiler, uh, the team out Palo Alto. Okay, that was not done at MOS or uh, Commodore Valley, you know, King of Prussia, Valley Forge area. Um, so they did that work there. Okay, so um, yeah, they took the, the the Microsoft Basic kernel that we had got from Bill Gates for the PET, and that became the the foundation for that. And then they layered on the other pieces. Okay. Um, so there was an actual intent to produce a kernel then. It wasn't just an outgrowth of the fact that we had to make a basic layer for Microsoft to call. No, it was there was a yeah, there was a real effort. I mean, they they made it into a, a real kernel at that point, yes. Bob Russell was the team and, and the team were really responsible for that. Okay. And going from the VIC one to the VIC two, the biggest changes in my mind are the change from static RAM to dynamic RAM and uh, obviously addition of sprites resolution and the uh, smooth scrolling what right. else am i missing is there another big piece there that, that i want to add <laughs> that was it right there you you you, you described them um and that was the vision and uh i started with the vic 2 before the vic 20 was done okay so i wanted so i realized the vic one was not a successful video game chip so I said, okay, what do I have to do to make this a really successful game chip? Okay, and that was the things we just talked about: the, the sprites, the, the better resolution, so on and so on. Um, so I actually started architecturally to make the VIC-20 a much better video game chip. But then the VIC-20 became wildly successful, so that it was clear that we were going to use the VIC-2 chip as the video interface for the next generation VIC series computer, okay? So it morphed into that, but in, in, in actuality, there was nothing we really changed because, again, a, a video display is the same whether it's a game or it's a computer, it's still a video display. You may not need sprites, but I still felt that games were a good reason to have computers exist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, TI actually owned the copyright or trademark on Sprite, so I'm yeah. guessing they had a chip that had Sprites, or did they? Yeah, they, they, they had a product, and I, I forget the chip number, 74, 94, I forget the chip number on it, but they their, one of their chips had Sprites. They had eight Sprites, they were 8-bit eight by 8-bit, eight pretty, not very capable, okay, but 
they did develop that concept. Okay. Right? And um, I thought it was great. I mean, great. Because one of the biggest problems back then with microprocessor speeds was how do you move something around the screen? I mean, you, you were using, you know, you had, to, you had to be able to take a block and move it to another block in the screen somewhere on, with a complete X, XY flexibility. And there just wasn't enough CPU power to be able to do that effectively. So how do you move something easily on a screen? And, and that's, the sprites was a, was a great solution back then. And so um, I just extended the concept to say, okay, I'm going to make them bigger. I'm going to add color. I'm going to add whether they can be behind the background or in front of the background. Uh, I'm going to add collision. Again, collision detection was huge. Yeah. You had no way to do, and processes, again, weren't strong enough to figure out who would collide. So having that is in, in, in the chip allowed you to be able to do collision detection, whether it was against two sprites hitting together or whether it was a sprite hitting a, an object. So you had both sprite to sprite collision detection as well as sprite to background collision detection. And you only so, did it on non-transparent pixels too, if I'm right. Correct. Which made a big difference as a programmer anyway. Right, exactly. So, you know, having, I understood the problems that the programmers were dealing with and trying to get a, a complex video game with, with lots of moving objects. And the other nice feature of the sprites, they were reusable. So that once you finish the uh, 16 bits in the in the Y, or the 16 eight or 16 lines in the Y, then you could reuse it at the bottom portion of the screen. Okay, so a lot of guys did that, and, and I saw some amazing um, pre uh, demonstrations where people had like 24 sprites going around on the screen. This I just reuse. I just saw one this year finally after I guess it's been 40 years where somebody did a full screen sprite where it's. I am not entirely sure how they did it yet, but it's every 20 pixels they restarted another sprite out of the 24, and they have yeah. it across the entire screen. So it's effectively a single 320 by 200 sprite, which I had never seen before. And I'm wondering I if I saw that thing too. I saw yeah, I saw I mean, like probably on video somewhere. I saw that. It was incredible. Yeah. I, I don't <laughs> somebody somebody spent a lot of time doing that to figure out how to make that happen. <laughs> it was pretty impressive. <laughs> Now, Atari had, I think it was player missile graphics. I don't even remember what that was. Or they were very small, I'm guessing, but and only yes. a couple of them. And Yeah. Um, I mean, the Atari video engine was nothing more than a big shift register. Okay? It didn't have DMA. So the 6502 was literally doing load stores. So it would take some information from the ROM and then store that uh, based on the program in in the... Uh, in the shift register for the line, so you were all that was happening was essentially it was just simply load stores as fast as it could do, and then during vertical sync we tried to do the game logic. <laughs> and it was amazing that they could accomplish what they could accomplish because a missile was nothing more than than, a, than you know, putting a, a bit turning a bit on in the serial stream that was going out. The processor had to keep track and, and try to stay up on top of that. It was incredibly difficult. Um, I learned about the uh, pro the Atari machine because my, one of the things when I left Commodore, one of the things that I did, I designed a. Since I knew about, <clears throat> I knew it was how the Atari machine worked because I had done the, the ROMs with them on it. I basically said, well, again, I use the same thing. What if I took the cartridge that we plugged into the thing, and instead of making it ROM, make it RAM. And then I put a processor out there that would DMA with that RAM so that the Atari 2600 became nothing more than a video display manager. And then the external processor would fill out the RAM and, and, uh, and, the, and the software so it would essentially just spew the stuff out onto the screen. So by having two processors, you could do a lot more video game stuff. So um, I developed that and then after I left Commodore, it's the first thing I did when I left Commodore. Um, I tried to I lic I did license that to Atari. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, but uh, they ran into right before they brought it out. They ran into they ran into financial difficulty and never actually brought it to market. So it was one of those things that uh, you know it was going to turn like the twenty six hundred into like a, a Vic twenty like computer at the time. You know, but again, it's just simply saying okay. 
just treat 2600 as a video engine and don't have it do anything. Just spew out the data. You, know, you could do it if it was doing nothing else. So as long as it didn't have to do any logic, it was just doing load stores all day long, it could keep up and do a 20-character display. One thing that's always fascinated me, and you touched on it a bit earlier, is how the VIC chip knows at any given pixel whether it should be rendering a character or a sprite. And I'm not yeah, sure with the reuse how you would make that work. Yeah, the, well, there was a priority, it was a priority um, register for each sprite to determine where, what its priority in terms of the, uh, the, who was going to get displayed. So there was a, a sprite priority system, so what sprite would be displayed over another one, and then there was a sprite to background priority tree. Okay. okay? So, at, so you, there was this huge, <laughs> a big chunk of logic, so you had all this shifting stuff coming at you, you had the background information and the various sprites, and it would all funnel down, because eventually it had to become one shift register. So you'd have this entire big chunk, it was literally a big chunk of logic. I, I know I had the whole chip right here. <laughs> I don't know, you probably can't see it. It's probably too... Oh, really? That's amazing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this chunk of, um, I'm trying to get my priority, get, get organized here. Okay, this chunk over here, there's your priority logic encoder. <laughs> it's a big chunk of logic. It is. All these, this is all the sprite logic. I mean, I mean, literally, this is your, uh, this, this RAM over here was your uh, uh, RAM for your, um, uh, the line and the sprites that you had. And this is all the sprite logic, and this is the priority encoder. And then that all filtered up through here into the uh, output shift register and the color control. <laughs> and how many transistors would be in a chip of that size? Oh, well, this is probably 20,000 maybe. Okay. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think like the 6502 was about 10,000, I believe. This was about double that. One other thing I was wondering is why Jack Tremiel pushed so hard for 64K on a machine that couldn't really use 64K. Was it strictly marketing or was it? Well, we originally designed it for 16K. That was the first design architecture that we were going to do. Okay, we were, we're, so it was D, it was going to be DRAM anyway. So we had to have put all the logic and, and, and controls for, for D, the dynamic RAM. So during a, a meeting with Jack one time, we're going over the progress. Uh, he really said, listen, uh, I believe that 64K RAMs are going to become the, the normal, uh, the, the primary engine, and 16Ks are going to go away, and that the price of 64Ks are really going to drop. So from a um, capability, and well, he really wanted for marketing. And I said, wow, you want to give me 64K in this machine? I'll take it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, even though the machine couldn't handle it all, Again, by bank switching and, and various games, I mean, I already had to do bank switching in ROM, so we just put the bank switching capability so you could get it all the RAM, even though it really didn't have that space. So you had to play games to get, actually utilize it. But, yeah, it was, it was fundamentally marketing that was the primary reason, and then said, okay, how do we take advantage of it? Right. It may have been after you left, but I believe there was an effort for, was it a Commodore Mega 65 or something, a version of the 64 with faster CPU? And yep. Yeah, there was, there was quite a few. I mean, uh, Bill Hurd, as I was leaving, um, I think I left in September, September 1st of 1982. And um, Bill Hurd came in, I think, in January of 83. And he really became the guy who was propelling that whole Commodore line at that point. He, well, the 128 and so forth. And um, so, yeah, he, he um, that, that whole, there was quite a few products that were developed. I don't, there was many more developed than actually saw the light of day. And Bill, Bill really has a good history of that. Okay. And I think that really was one of the problems that happened is that, Commodore, once, once my team left that, that went to Insonic and then Jack left about a year or so later, two years later I think it was, Commodore kind of lost its, its lineage, I guess you will, I mean, or focus, where they should be. And, and there was a lot of competing factions 
And, and Jack was such a, such a, uh, uh, a strong player in the game that it left a void that no one ever really said, okay, we're going to go do that. Or, and this is what, and they never really grabbed it. And then they went down the Amiga path. And I always was surprised. I always thought that, that what I called the Vic 80 or the Commodore 80 or the, the, the uh, yeah, Vic 80 at that point was going to be a, a product that um, was based on the Intel processor. I always thought that if, if Commodore had taken the Amiga video set or, or some other video processing capability and added that to the IBM product line, okay, and had and I know that they would have really been upset about having the licensed DOS, but I always felt that if they had gone down that path, it would have been they would still be here today right. because they had the video engine, they had audio. And, and they were ahead of the game on everybody else in that in that graphics engine area, and but yet because they didn't have a mainstream processor, they always were fighting against that. Uh, let's see what else have I got here. I think that's almost. Oh, one thing I wanted to ask you about is on color on the Vic Two, and I don't really understand this, but there's three lines come out and they run to a forty sixty six chip that seems to be. Some kind of multiplexer. I'm trying to figure out what that does. What's that chip for? Oh, well, that's actually that's actually the color ramp. Okay, that multiplexer essentially was a cheap DMA controller. <laughs> okay. So you have you have the data bus that comes from the microprocessor because you've got to fill out the color ramp. Okay, and the video chip has to access the color ramp. Okay, so how do you? I've got a data bus from two things, and how do you get them two to talk to each other? All right. So what I did was I said, okay, I'm going to use a, a, a 4066 as a rather than having to have a buffer system that the dual buffer control, you just use a pass transistor, which is what a 4066 is. So when when the video chip needed it, I would turn the thing off so that the data bus would go right to the video chip. And I knew that I wasn't going to be using it, so I'd turn off the buffers on the video chip and open up that pass transistor so the microprocessor could get to it. <laughs> okay. So it was just that, because there was no easy way. I needed more band, I didn't have enough bandwidth to get all the characters and the sprite data and the sprite color information in, 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 in I just didn't have enough DMA bandwidth. So I could fit it conveniently into the DRAM somewhere and get another accesses for that. So I just stuck the color RAM in this static RAM out there and, and talked to it through this uh, pass transistor structure. <laughs> it, you know, it, was, it was like, okay, how do I get around this problem? I need color information, and um, that was the only way to do it that was convenient. <laughs> Um, what else was I going to ask you? Oh, in the Don Lancaster book, he talks about an upstream memory tap. And what I believe he's doing is he has a separate set of address lines and data lines that go to the RAM, and he turns off CPU access to the RAM so that the yep. video can draw it. And right. that was one of your bigger breakthroughs, I think, was with the ability to have this trimming structure so you never had to lock the CPU out. Right, right. That's by forcing the memory to run twice as fast as the CPU and, and making sure that that everything was on alternate cycles. As long as your RAM ran twice as fast as the processor and video subsystem, then you had you never interfered with each other. So all of the constraints on the design were a function of how fast the RAM could go. So as long as your RAM was faster, you could you could do a, a true non-interfering -inter DMA structure, and and that was really important because once you you know, if you got to shut down the CPU to get to the memory, uh, you've just really limited what you can do. So I, I really wanted to avoid that. that right. Well, you know, since both have ex effectively de facto exclusive access to the RAM when they want it, why is it actually slower when you're in the rasterized area and displaying characters and stuff? It's the, the system, system is faster when you're in the background area. Well, it, it's not. It's the same. I never. Uh, well, I never shut the processor down. I, I think there's a 60 microsecond. I do have to shut it down in one area to be able to go do a prefetch. And I can't remember the details. It's been 40 years ago. <laughs> I, I did do a prefetch for 60 microseconds. I did have to shut the processor down for like 60 microseconds. 
But that was it. It wasn't during the entire vertical blanking, but it was a prefetch I had to do. I, I can't remember the details right now. But the process never ran much slower um, than I recall for blanking. Um, it was only that prefetch area where I had to do the 60 microseconds. So it was, yes, it was a little slower, but it wasn't dramatic. But I don't remember the details of what the timing was. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember why they had to turn off the screen to load from tape, I guess. Is in oh, some that's Yes, that's a whole different animal right there. Yeah, oh, okay. There, there was, yeah, that was um, in the whole tape. That was in the operating system of the tape system because they had the, the, the shift register wasn't wasn't running fast enough. I don't. That was not my design area. Okay, I did not. Uh, that that came out of the the Vic Twenty and, and Bob uh, Bob Russell worked on that uh, process there, but I don't know the details. Okay. Well, that's really all I've got. If there's anything more you want to throw in here, by all means, tell me another story. But fun. Um, I mean, I I really enjoyed the my my atomic commodore. It was a lot of fun. It it prepared me to be an entrepreneur, which is really always always what he, what I wanted to be. Um, and you know, designing chips back then was it was so exciting because you could you could think of things and execute on them in, in, in a reasonable period of time, and the, and, the, and the costs were not the kind of costs that you have to deal with today, and who knows, it was complicated. So it was like the Wild West, if you will. <laughs> right. But it was fun. It was fun to be able to be part of that era and have an impact on, on what, what the world of computing turned into. Uh, so you know, definitely satisfying from that perspective and uh, enjoyed it a lot. So and it just prepared me for all the other things I did in life and, and the companies that I that I've worked with and started. So I enjoyed it. Cool. Well, thanks so much for being so gracious with your time and patient with the technical issues. And mm -hmm. good. Well, I hope you found it interesting. I and, sure did. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Well, Dave, thank you very much and well, enjoyed it. And thank you. Nice okay. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Now, if you made it this far, there's no reason not to be subscribed to the channel. Plus, you don't want to miss the next installment in the series featuring Bill Hurd of Commodore 128 fame. Now, if you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything that I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Glenn! Do it! This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage. <laughs>